It's good to be with you. My name is Jared Rumley. I'm one of the pastors here, and uh, I have the privilege of calling us into worship this morning, and I uh, just want you to be encouraged about where we're going today. It's a, uh, it's a good vitamin day. It's a big old horse pill of a vitamin we got to take, but it'll be helpful for our bodies. And, you know, I've been thinking about this weekend because it's kind of been a weekend for me that's been saturated with a lot of gospel. We had Jared C. Wilson with us on Friday night with some of our leadership, and Saturday was open to churchwide, and he spoke kind of on gospel-driven leadership, and then on the gospel-wakened church and what that was like. And one of the things he said this weekend, he said, why is it that people can be themselves at home and at work, but they don't do that at the gathering of the church? Why, why do we let our hair down and be authentic and communicate and be real about our problems at home or even at work? We're passionate, we're engaged, and then, you know, we come to church and it's like, hey, brother, hey, brother, hey, sister, hmm, things are great. And we just really don't ever let anybody see who we are. He said the gospel actually should be the thing and the church should be the place where you're the most who you are because you know what you've been saved from. You know what has been no longer counted against you as a Christian, and so we are praying for that kind of continued development here at this place. We have seen glimpses and hopes of that. We have seen a lot of growth over the last five years just in people really embracing their identity in Jesus. I know sometimes when you start to do that, life is hard. And uh, suffering, the discipline of the Lord uh, is hard. And that's what we're going to be talking about in our text today. But I want you to know it's really all for good. The hard things are good. Uh, my son is um, playing currently the Atlanta United U15 team. So his club team is a pretty good team. They travel around. But they're playing the Atlanta United U15 team, so the kids who are looking to get contracts someday. And I checked my phone right before we started worship, and it was already 2-0 after the first three, 13 minutes, and Cooper's team was not winning. <laughs> but I just told him, I said, man, enjoy the experience today. and Enjoy pushing yourself to see where you are in comparison. Enjoy being at a training facility. And even if it's hard, it's going to show you a real picture of where you are. But then he left the door and I said, hey, remember, this game doesn't define you. It reveals who you are. And a lot of times in life, I think we need that perspective when it comes to God growing us, that really what we show through those things is who we really are. And it's less about what's happening and more about what God's doing in us. So I'm going to read something from Psalm 94 that I think will just get our hearts and minds in the right perspective. And then uh, we'll continue in worship. Psalm 94 Verse 12 says this, Blessed is the man whom you discipline, O Lord, and whom you teach out of your law to give him rest from days of trouble until a pit is dug for the wicked. For the Lord will not forsake his people. He will not abandon his heritage. For justice will return to the righteous, and all the upright in heart will follow it. Who rises up for me against the wicked? Who stands up for me against evildoers? If the Lord had not been my help, my soul would soon have lived in the land of silence. When I thought my foot slips, your steadfast love, O oh Lord, held me up. When the cares of my heart are many, your con consolations cheer my soul. Can wicked rulers be allied with you, those who frame injustice by statute? They band together against the life of the righteous and condemned and, and the innocent to death. But the Lord has become my stronghold and my God, the rock of my refuge. Would you stand with me and let me pray? We'll get our hearts and minds ready. Father, we come and we bring all the complexities of life and all the layers and emotions. We bring our struggles and our joys. We want to experience you. We want to hear from your word, your voice. You speak most clearly when the words of Scripture are read aloud. So we hear you this morning, God. And we ask that the Spirit do a work that only the Spirit can do. As broken people come with that offering, their brokenness, to say, God, do a work in me. So give us perspective today. Strengthen our hearts and our minds. Make them tender and receptive, not stubborn and rebellious. And so we do pray to the God that hears prayers. And we're grateful now to sing with our lips to strengthen side by side brothers and sisters' faith, we now worship an audience of one. Father, thanks for your son, Jesus Christ. We pray these prayers in his name.
virtues of our God and King. Lift up your voice and with us sing. Oh, praise Him. Hallelujah. Thou burning sun with golden beam. Thou silver moon with softer gleam. Hear my 
desperation. For so long I've pled and prayed. God, come to my rescue. Even so, the thorn remains. Still, my heart won't praise you. Storms within my troubled soul, questions without answers. Don't my faith is people's role. God be now my shelter. Why are you cast down my soul? Hope in Him who saves you. When the fires of old grow cold, cause His heart to praise you. My soul. That's right. And should my life be torn from me, every worldly pleasure, when all I Possess his grief. God be then my treasure. Be my vision. Be my vision in the night. Be my hope, my refuge. Until my faith is turned to sight. Lord, my heart will praise you. Oh, my soul. guys would go ahead and have a seat. Now as we hear the words of God, let us listen and respond to the reading of God's word. Our scripture for today is from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 3 through 17, English Standard Version. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the ones he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have it to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there from whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? 
For they disciplined us for a short time, as it seemed best for them. But he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, lift up your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Strive for peace with everyone, and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it may become defiled, that no one is sexually immoral, and unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he, he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. Let us continue in the worship and the preaching of God's word. Good morning, everybody. My name is Jordan. I'm one of the pastors here. I'm really grateful to be here to open God's word and, and look to his wisdom with you. If you have your Bibles, I would go to Hebrews chapter 12, when we're going to start in verse 3. And I'm curious if any of you have ever attempted to run a marathon or a race. Maybe you and your family have tried to do one of those turkey trots at Thanksgiving and kind of burn off and advance the food that you knew you were going to eat for Thanksgiving. Um, even uh, if you've driven here from uh, PIB, you know that there was like a marathon this morning and people were, were racing. I don't know how long the, the race was, but um, there was one happening this morning and it, it's going to have to do with this text by the providence of God. If you were here last week, you know that Jared preached about running the race, that Christ ran the race of faith before us and he did it perfectly. Um, but this author is not just saying that Jesus ran a race of faith. He's talking about the Christian life as a life of endurance, a life that is a race. Running a race is our pursuit of remaining a Christian, okay? Now, the, the Hebrew Christians who had come to faith in the day when this letter was sent to them were suffering immense persecution for their faith, they were living not in just like a pluralistic religious society like we do. They were living in an openly hostile, antagonistic, dangerous world that hated Christians and wanted to um, maybe kill them, but at least cause them immense psychological and physical suffering. So these people were exhausted from running the race. They were fearful. They were weary. They were faint-hearted. Um, and unlike us, you know, today we, we don't really have a lot of physical persecution in America. However, we have a lot of social pressure uh, in America for being a Christian, certainly. These people were dealing with both social and physical, which adds a lot to the plate of a Christian trying to run faithfully. And so this gospel writer in Hebrews chapter 12 is, is finding these, these runners, in a sense. Imagine with me, actually, that he has found these runners who are suffering and weary and faint-hearted, no longer running on the race track. They are sitting off on the sidelines. When I was in high school, I hated running. That was like my least favorite thing for PE. Um, and that's often like everyone's favorite class. Like I'm a youth pastor, so one of the things I try to get, you know, I ask students because most of the time they don't want to talk to me. So I, I invite them in with a question like, what's your favorite subject? And everyone's always like, oh, it's, it's PE for sure. Why? Because you don't have to read anything. Okay, cool. Well, I, I like to read and I don't like to run. So I... <laughs> I understand like, what it's like to try to endure um, running the mile in high school and middle school, and I did it poorly, and I hardly ever passed um, my running times um, that were required, so it was just really not fun. But I understand, I'm sure you understand, that it is hard work running the marathon of the Christian faith. And he is trying in this letter to keep them from apostatizing that is a crazy word. We don't use it often, but it's, it's brought up a lot in this book. Apostasy is the hardening of your heart towards the things of the Lord. Simply put, as one Bible teacher says, apostasy is giving up. Apostasy is giving up the race of the Christian faith. It is quitting the race of remaining a Christian, okay? So he is finding these, these believers on the side of the racetrack, and they've, they've almost given up hope 
and they've almost given up their endurance to keep running. And so it's like this, this writer in our passage today puts on his little coaching cap, and he, he's, he's preparing to give them gospel coaching instructions on how to keep running the race even when life is hard. And so imagine, what would you tell them? What would you tell tired Christians suffering physical, mental persecution? What are the words that you think would be most helpful to get them back on the track? What would be the words you'd use to get them to endure, to put their feet back on that racetrack and pursue the Lord? Well, this gospel coach today in Hebrews 12, 3 through 17, talks about the importance of gospel endurance. And the structure of his coaching instruction is this. Verses 3 through 4 tells us where to find this endurance. Verses 5 through 11 tells us why it matters. And then verses 12 through 17 tells us how to use this gospel endurance. So this coach is telling them, gospel endurance matters. Where do you find it? Why it matters? And how to use it? And by the end of his instruction, I think he hopefully convinces these Christians, and hopefully he convinces us as well, that the trustworthy training of God is exactly what we need as suffering Christians to endure to the end. The trustworthy training of God is exactly what suffering Christians need to endure to the end. And he begins by helping them see where to find their gospel endurance. And it's by focusing on Jesus. In verses 3 and 4, the author basically says, here is the spiritual fuel your soul needs. It's Jesus. Consider Jesus. Jesus is like jet fuel to the Christian soul. It ignites us and propels us to move on. But it's not just like thinking about Jesus and having like a floating Jesus in our mind's eye. It's, it's more intentional than that. It's a discipline to remember Jesus thoughtfully in a way that helps us. We see that this writer explains that they must consider, verse 3, consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. So we know this, right? These, these runners are weary. They're faint-hearted. They're fearful and they're tired, but they are to consider Jesus. And this isn't just like, hey, I'm throwing out the idea of Jesus. Consider him. Think about him. You know, you know come back to me with what you, you think about him. It's great. Um, it's not this flippant, like, open-handed, like, consider Jesus. No, it's like, reflect on Jesus because your soul is at stake. Reflect on Jesus because apostasy is a real threat to the Christian life. And if you think that maybe apostasy is this, like, Old Testament or New Testament thing, and it doesn't really apply to the church today, I, I would tell you that you are sorely mistaken. And in fact, talk to a couple people in this room, and I'm sure you'll eventually find somebody more quickly than you'd expect who knows somebody who has quit the faith. Quitting the faith is a very present danger today. Not just at Shadowbrook, but at the, in the church universal. It is a major problem. People have spiritual fragility that isn't being corrected by gospel courage. So we must consider Jesus when life is hard. What this could look like is whenever you are being tempted to give up the Christian race because life is hard. Maybe you've had a friend who's betrayed you. Think about Jesus. Consider Jesus who was betrayed at the hands of one of his closest friends who essentially was part of the, the plot to send him to the cross. If you know what it's like to pursue faithfulness today in 2021 in Swanee, Georgia, consider Jesus who suffered 2,000 years ago at the hands of his Jewish people and Roman people, uh, mockery, scorn, teasing, brutality against him because he remained faithful to Yahweh. We must consider Jesus and connect our sufferings to what Jesus suffered. Jesus is the son of God who perfectly obeyed every commandment that we failed to do. But he didn't just perfectly live the life we needed to live and couldn't. He, he entered into our human story and he suffered with us so that he could identify with us for this very reason. So that we would not lose hope when life gets hard. The writer knows that we need an external resource to help us keep going. I don't know if you've ever tried to do like a, like a serious like diet or train for a marathon. But you know how easy it is to give up when you're doing it by yourself right? We always need external help to like do long-term commitments. And that's why he's saying, consider Jesus. He goes on in verse four to say, in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. 
So not only is the Christian race supposed to be a, a race that we run, but he's also giving us the imagery of a battleground. Being a Christian is a struggle. It's warfare against the sin of giving up. It's, it, it's the sin of apostasy that I think he's talking about here. We must fight with everything that we have in us, independence on the Holy Spirit and the gospel, to struggle against sin with all of our might as long as we live. But then he says this, this second part that you guys haven't really suffered that, that badly. Do you see that? I, I thought that that was really interesting. He says that, by the way, like you haven't really resisted for your faith to the point of dying for it. I don't think he's trying to belittle the suffering that they were going through, these Hebrew Christians. I don't think he's trying to belittle our experience of suffering. Do we have more of like first world suffering for being a Christian in America? Probably. Do we suffer in the same ways people in Uganda or Iran or Iraq suffer for their faith today? No, we don't. I don't think so. But he's not trying to dismiss that, but he's trying to remind them of Jesus again. It's always going back to Jesus. You guys haven't shed your blood for, for Christ. If you're hearing this letter, you haven't shed your blood for Christ. You have not died for your faith. So remember Jesus, who when he went to the cross, not only suffered at the hands of evil sinners, but he also took on himself the wrath of God that we deserved, and he drank every last drop of the cup of God's wrath so that when we suffer in 2021, we would know that we are not suffering God's wrath if we are a Christian. We are merely suffering God's discipline as he grows us up in the faith. So Jesus suffered to the point of death, and he suffered to the point of death for you. We have to consider that. It will give us steel in our spines to keep going when life gets hard. Don't forget to consider Jesus. And in our struggle against sin, we must be very, very careful when life gets difficult, when suffering comes, to not try to escape it with sin. I love how Lou Priolo says this. He's a biblical counselor in our area, and he, he wrote a fantastic book on marriage. And he says this, endurance requires the ability to weather a trial without resorting to sinful means of deliverance. So we're not living as an enduring Christian, when we, used, when we use sinful things to endure the punishments or the sufferings or whatever that's going on in our life, that is not the way of Christ. Christ suffered faithfully and perfectly on our behalf. Are we gonna suffer pain, uh, perfectly? No, we're not. We will be tempted to use sinful means to escape punishments and pains and suffering and Jesus knows that his blood covers us for that. But nonetheless, we are to do everything that we are able to do in our own power to not escape suffering by trusting in sins. We are not to do that. That is not the way of Christ. That's not the way of Christians. So we must remember that the gospel endurance that we so need, that these Hebrew Christians so needed, happens or it's unleashed when we trust that Christ suffered deeply for us at the cross and we remember that God the Father sustained Jesus, and therefore we have the guarantee that he can sustain us because Jesus suffered infinitely more than we did, and he remained faithful unto death, and so can we by God's power. That should give us encouragement. That's where we look for endurance. We look to Jesus. Now the gospel coach is gonna go on and give them instructions on why endurance matters. Um, if you have kids, you know that one of the most popular questions they like to ask their parents is why, 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 why? You know, it's not just like, what are we doing? It's why are we doing that? And then what's the why behind the why behind the why? We need to answer the why endurance is, is important here, okay? Endurance is important in the Christian life because it is a sign that we are God's children. And we need that. As much as you may not think so, we need to have an assurance of our faith that God is keeping us, has accepted us, has loved us. And let's look at the text here. He says this in verse five. And have you forgotten, Hebrew Christians, have you forgotten, Shadowbrook Church, the exhortation that addresses you as sons? And now he's gonna use scripture from the Old Testament to encourage their faith. He quotes Proverbs 3, 11 through 12, and he says this, My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. 
So to be disciplined by God is to be loved by God. That's really important to get. Because so often when life is painful, we want to run and we hate it and we hate the person that's causing us suffering. But we, we can't do that as Christians. If you have trusted in Christ and your life is difficult, you have to acknowledge that God is so sovereign in control in, and wise that he is allowing things to happen in your life that you may not love. And you have to be okay with that. And in fact, you should be assured in those moments that God absolutely loves you and accepts you as his child. Because all good parents discipline their kids, right? As much as we may have hated it when we were kids or if you're a kid now, discipline is not fun. And we're gonna hear more about that in a minute. But when we look back as a 29-year-old, I know that every time my parents disciplined me or, or did the best they could to discipline me, I, I know now like as much as that was not fun, like they were doing it because they loved me. God disciplines his children because he wants their, their, their spiritual best, and so he, he chastises them in love. It's not punishment. It's merely educating them to grow up to be more like Christ. Sometimes it may be the result of sin, but it's never punishment. God took all the Christian's punishment at the cross. Every ounce of suffering in your life for the Christian is educating you, is correcting you. It's not out of hatred. It's out of love because he's a good father. And here's the dynamic that we also have to understand, right? If any of you have ever done, you know, an athletic thing when you were in school or you, you like to weightlift now, you recognize that, like, when you go to practice, it is not fun in the moment. You have to do squats, you have to do bicep curls, pull-ups, all of that stuff. Um, when I used to live in Fresno, California, to my shame, I tried to be a bodybuilder in high school. And obviously that didn't really work out. Um, but nonetheless, I understand the dynamic that when you go to the gym and you try to bulk up, you have to tear down your muscles. You have to do squats. You have to do bicep curls. These things are not fun in the moment. But as you are doing them, you know that the pain that you're bringing to your muscles are literally tearing them down, putting pressure on them so that when you come back tomorrow or the next day, you can do one extra rep or one extra set. So discipline Putting pressure on our bodies makes us stronger physically. In the same way, but much more importantly, God puts pressure on the, the, the Christian to help them grow up to have stronger spiritual muscles so that, so that they can endure as the suffering increases, as life becomes more complex. We want to be disciplined, or we should want to be disciplined. And the thing is, if you noticed in the text that he's quoting from Proverbs 3, is, is that he says that we are not to regard God's discipline lightly. We're not to become weary when reproved. It's easy to become weary when we're disciplined by our parents. It's easy to become disheartened when we are disciplined by God. But that is not the attitude we're supposed to take. Michael Kruger, who's a really great Bible teacher, says that when it comes to being disciplined by the Lord, it's not just the pain that God brings to you that makes you change. It's pain plus faith that God is working everything according to your good. So we have to acknowledge, hey, there's pain in my life. What do I do? Do I despise it? Do I become so hopeless that, that I, I start to hate God or, or just become bitter towards him? No, you have to have a God-centered perspective that he's using this for my good. And so I need the faith to go with it. Faith plus pain is what will bring change, not pain alone. Don't waste the pain that you are experiencing in your life. Like, how silly would that be? Readjust your perspective and expectations of what God is doing when your life is not going the way you want it so that you can grow, you can be changed and become a stronger believer. That is key. And as you change through this process, you'll learn to endure. Verse seven says, it is for discipline that you have to endure. It is for discipline that you have to endure. So imagine like, you're on a bike, right? You have to use two pedals at, a, at any given moment to keep the bike moving forward. What I think verse seven is saying is, listen, like you can't just endure in life. Like you can't just take the pain and not have the attitude to go with it. You have to have discipline and an enduring attitude. You have to have both in order to drive 
your Christian life forward in maturity, in, in pursuing holiness. You must have both or you're gonna fall. And here's the thing. Back in Hebrews chapter five, verse eight, I, this is still mind-blowing to me, but like Jesus in, five, in, in chapter five, verse eight, had to learn obedience through what he suffered. Like it, it literally says that, that Jesus had to learn obedience through what he suffered. Jesus was never sinful, never guilty of sin. However, as he grew as a human being, he learned human obedience through what God allowed him to suffer. How much more so do we need the suffering and the discipline of the Lord to help us become holier people? If Jesus needed it, we certainly need it. We need discipline, and so we should also want it because it's integrally tied to our adoption as sons and our assurance of salvation. What do I mean by that? Well, when we are disciplined, when life is hard and we're claiming to be a Christian, we need to ask ourselves this really silly question, and I'm, I'm saying it silly because I, I acknowledge that, but I hope it helps you remember it. When you are suffering, you should ask yourself, who's your daddy? Because when you ask yourself, who's your daddy, when life is hard, I want you to remember this text that says, God is treating you as sons when life is awful for you and you feel like you can hardly, like, you can hardly make it to this next round uh, in the Christian life. You need to remember that God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? When you have discipline in your life, be assured that God is working in your life because you're his child. He's adopted you into his family. God the Father has taken you into his family because at the cross, Christ signed your adoption papers with his blood, with the shedding of his blood, with the perfect endurance of faith that we could never have lived up to. So we ought to praise and celebrate Jesus for his faithful endurance that we cannot live up to. Jesus is certainly a model of how we are to endure in life, but he is much more than a model of endurance because he is our savior. He does what we could never do, and we ought to celebrate him for that. Now, in verse 8, we have to be aware that there are people who claim to be Christians, and obviously, I don't know anyone's heart like God does. We, you don't know anyone's heart like God does, but there are people who claim to be Christians who seem to not be marked by discipline. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. Verse eight says this, if you are left without discipline in which all have participated, he's talking about Christians, all Christians have participated in discipline. So if you are left without it, then you are an illegitimate child. You are not sons. So okay, if your life is hard and you claim to know Christ, that shouldn't really alarm you, okay? Because God is working through your pain. I think the person who should be concerned is the person who claims to know Christ, but who has a, generally speaking, an, an easy, pain-free life. You don't know the discomforting feeling of giving away things that cost you something for your, your faith. You don't know what it means to feel the conviction and burden of your sins that need forgiveness. You don't know the discomfort of seeking to, to share the gospel with people out of love for them, at great cost to yourself. If these are typical, classic Christian discomforts that we experience in this life, and that's something that is utterly foreign to your experience, then it's fair to ask yourself if you've ever experienced the discipline of the Lord. And in fact, it's, it's fair to question whether or not you truly are a child of God the Father. And I, I don't say that to... to scare you, but I hope that that would be an alarming reality that wakes you up to maybe reconsider where you stand before the Lord. And in fact, that's something that happened to me when I was in high school. Um, I was living like a Christian. I don't think I really was, though. And, and I was hiding all these things that I was, I was living for, um, these dark things that I was wanting to do. I was very selfish, and I hid things from my family and my church. And eventually, like, those things started to catch up to me. And I, I started to become depressed, and I just started to feel numb about life. And, like, I, I just, I don't know. It was just, it was a dark season of my life, and so I asked my parents to recommend a counselor to me. They did, and by God's grace, it was a biblical counselor who trusted that the gospel is what saves and sanctifies God's people. And so when I met with this person, 
we walked through the sins that I was holding on to, that I was living in darkness for, and eventually we got to the conversation point where I, I just told him, like, I don't want to give this up. I don't feel obligated to get rid of these things. I want to hold on to them. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm only 16. Like, I, I want to keep doing these things, and maybe one day, like, I'll give myself to, to the Lord holy. And you know what passage he took me to? He took me to this one. He took me to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 8. And this counselor read it with me, and he said, Jordan, if you're left without discipline, in which all Christians have participated, then maybe you're an Ill- illegitimate child, and you're not a son of God. And that is still a memory burned in my brain. And I, I thank Ron Clymer from Fresno, California, who said these difficult words to me, because eventually I think that that was part of God's process in stirring me to deep faith and deep commitment to Jesus Christ that helped me get free from sins that mastered my life in high school. So I, I, I'm not telling you that if you think that you're not a child of God because you don't have suffering, run to suffering. I'm saying run to your Savior because suffering is only a byproduct of following Christ. We don't pursue suffering because we want to suffer and, and say that that's why we're a Christian. No, we, we pursue a living relationship with the human and divine person that is Jesus Christ. And trust me, suffering will come eventually. Um, suffering will come. So run to your Savior not the suffering, if you are alarmed that you may not be a child of God. Now, he's going to go on to explain what this father is like, this heavenly father. We're getting a picture that he loves to discipline us because he loves us. And he's going to use a comparison between earthly parents and our heavenly father to make sense of this. Verse 9 says this, Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. Shall we not? much more be subject to the father of spirits. And that's a way of saying our heavenly father. He's a father of spirits. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they, meaning our earthly parents, disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness. So listen, he's not talking about bad parents here. He's not saying God is like your bad parents. If you have bad parents, abusive parents, that is not the comparison this text is trying to make. Um, that is not the text, or not the comparison he's trying to make, okay? He's trying to say, generally speaking, your parents who pursue the Lord care about you enough to discipline you because they love you. And they only do it for a short time. Most of us who are adults in this room probably don't live at home, and you're no longer under the disciplining, corrective, educative care of your parents. That's just human lifestyle, uh, a human lifespan, right? We eventually age out of our parents' discipline. You never age out of God's perfect parental discipline. And all the more reason should we celebrate our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who purchased for us a father that adopted us and will walk with us every step of this life to complete the race faithfully. So we are to praise our father who loves us enough to continue eternally to parent us. He is eternally our father. We never lose him as our dad. And he does this for us because he wants us to share his holiness. God is holy. That means he's, he's absolutely and utterly one of a kind, perfect. Every good, virtuous attribute is God's, and he lives that out to the fullest extent and to the greatest measure. We cannot compare. We cannot come close to him. And so Jesus had to give us his holiness. And God is growing us in this holy Christ-likeness over time through difficulties. So we need to lean into that. We need to lean into that. But here's the good thing, too. I know that suffering as a Christian is really hard. You may have it harder than I do. I understand that. But it's, it's helpful that, like, the, the, this gospel coach kind of just throws out there, by the way, I know it's really hard. Verse 11 says this, For the moment, all discipline seems painful. Well, thank you for acknowledging that. Rather than pleasant. There there must be something about pain that helps us grow in ways that pleasure simply can't. Right? There has to be something about about suffering that really just forms us in godly ways that, that pleasures and comforts just can't. He's acknowledging that. But here's the good news. Later, this yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So, endure God's discipline, and you will know what peace is like. And you will be a peacemaker, peacekeeper, an enjoyer of peace. You will live righteously, 
which is a rightness that is modeled after the pattern of Christ. All the while recognizing that pain is a training of God that is absolutely worth the results. It is absolutely worth peacefulness and righteous living. Right now, I'm reading through C.S. Lewis's The Chronicles of Narnia for my first time, and I'm, I just finished book six, which is called The Silver Chair. In that book, there is a character whose name is Puddle Glum, and he is this animal humanoid thing that is a loyal supporter of King Aslan, and he loves Narnia. Puddle Glum gets into a situation where he and two humans, as well as the king of Narnia, Prince Rillian, are stuck in this underworld, and they're trying to escape, and then they come across this evil witch who does not want them to leave. She wants to keep them in the underworld, and it just so happens where this witch finally catches up to these four people is in a room with a fireplace, and this, this witch, who I'm sure knows all sorts of spells, figures out that she can throw this green enchantment powder onto the fire, and as they're trying to escape this witch, the, the green fumes begin to alter the minds of Puddleglum, the two children, and Prince Rillian, and as the witch is manipulating them with what she's telling them, they're beginning to forget the land of Narnia that they once loved. They're beginning to forget that Aslan was a real person, that they served as king. They're beginning to forget the way of their, their king and master. But Puddleglum, with the last bit of rational thinking he has before his mind goes to mush from this enchantment, walks over to the fire, and he looks into it, and he knows that the only way to get out of this is pain. And so he puts his, his foot into the fire, and he stomps it out as quickly as he can, and he gets most of it out. And obviously his foot is burned, and it's not great. Like, if you've ever been burned, you know that that is an awful feeling. But he does this, and because of that act of selflessness, that, that act of discipline, in the midst of suffering, he's able to free his friends from the enchantment and he stops the curse from, from taking over their minds. And eventually they slay the witch and escape the underworld and go back to Aslan. But here's the thing. If we want to change as Christians, if we want to change, if we want to wake up from the, the spiritual enchantments of materialism, of secular thinking of our culture today, if we want to be free of those things and run a pure-hearted race after our Savior, Jesus Christ, then we have to trust that God is doing something for our good when he holds our feet over the fire. We have to trust that he's doing something good in our lives that could not be done otherwise when he holds our feet over the fire. We have to lean into the suffering at times and recognize that God is doing something that would be utterly impossible any other way. He is all wise, all loving. I will trust him. I will be like Puddleglum and trust him. W.H. Auden is an English poet, and he says something uh, about human nature that was really haunting to me as I was studying for this text. And this text is basically about being changed unto holiness through pain. W.H. Auden gets something about human nature that is absolutely frightening. And hear what he says. He says this. We would rather be ruined than changed. We would rather die in our dread then climb the cross of the moment and let our illusions die. If we're honest, we're afraid to be changed by the Lord. We don't want to give our sins up that, so, so, that have lived with us so closely for so long. We don't want to let the Lord change us at times, if we're honest. But we have to be willing to dive into the gospel deep enough to give us the supernatural courage to give over our sins to the Lord so that we can be changed. It's only through the courage that is guaranteed in the gospel that promises that all sinners and all sins can be forgiven in Christ that we have the courage to finally let go and trust that the Lord will do the rest with the change process. And once we realize how this matters in our life, how gospel endurance matters, we need to know how to use it. And that's exactly what the coach does with the next uh, set of instructions to these, these wallowing Christians. Remember, we have these Christians on the side of the track and they're wallowing in their pains. Their lungs are burning from running too long. They have bloodied legs. They have shin splints. 
they need continued words of gospel coaching. And so here it is. This is what you do once you have the encouragement. Once you have found your, encourage, your endurance in Jesus and you know why it matters, now you need to apply it. And that's what verse 12 through 17 is about. The author knows that the time is short. We have to run this race. We have to get back in it. Otherwise, we will apostatize. We will give up eventually if we don't do anything drastic. So he says, verse 12, therefore, lift your drooping hands, strengthen your weak knees, and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Essentially, he's, he's being what we don't love about coaches, but we know we need in coaches. He's saying, get your feet back on that racetrack. Like, get up, brace yourselves with the beauty of the gospel, which enlivens our souls, and start running again. Start running again. We have to hold on to our hope. We have to remember the joy that is set before us at the end of this race in Christ. And for those of you who are running really well, I mean, that's something to praise God for. It's not in your own power to do that, by the way. But some of us have a, a larger deposit of faith. That's oftentimes not me. I, I'm very like, jealous of those who have the gift of deep faith. But if you have that, if you are a strong runner in this race of faith, you have the obligation to help your weaker brothers and sisters to strengthen their weak knees, to help set their feet back on the track. Making it to the end of our life faithful to Christ requires one another. We need this. That is our code of conduct as athletes in God's race. We have to rely on each other to make it to the end. And on this race, we see what kind of people we have to be as well in verse 14. He says that we ought to strive for peace with everyone, including believers and unbelievers. We strive for peace with them, and we strive for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. So holiness is essentially a life that is dedicated to God. It is devoted in heart, mind, soul, body, everything about you dedicated to the Lord. You have to strive for that, and you have to strive for peace with your neighbors. That is a life of holiness as you are running the race. And Matthew 5, 8, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount says this. This is Jesus talking. He says, blessed are the pure in heart. Do you know why they're blessed? Because only the pure in heart will see God. We must strive for holiness. We must strive for Christ's likeness because without that, we will not see the Lord. If you're feeling pretty heavy, like, this is a heavy command. I want you to remember that you don't do it alone, and we rely on the Lord to help us. In fact, in Romans chapter 15, verse 5, you don't have to turn there, but God identifies himself at the end of that letter as the God of endurance and encouragement. That is awesome. Literally, what this passage has been talking about is that we need endurance and we need encouragement. And that is exactly who God calls himself, the God of of endurance, the God of encouragement. So his co this coach ends his instruction on gospel endurance by warning his runners about three ways of being in the world that are disqualifying. I'm not meaning if you do it once, like this is over for you, but these are three patterns of living that are so dangerous to the individual Christian and to the community of faith that he warns them not to be like these people. In verse 15, he says, see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. And I think in the context of this running metaphor and enduring metaphor, I think he's talking about the people who are so spiritually fragile and undisciplined that when life gets hard, when the heat gets turned up, they give up the grace of God. They fail to obtain it because of spiritual fragility. The other kind of person we're warned not to be like is the person who has a root of bitterness, who springs up and causes trouble, and by it, many other people become defiled. So the bitter person is something and someone we need to watch out for. By the way, we need to check ourselves before we start calling out other people. We need to get the log out of our own eye before we go inspect the speck in our brother's eye. If you've ever been around a bitter person, you know how like gangrene 
their bitterness begins to just kind of seep off of them onto you. And you start to feel bitter yourself. You start to say cynical things and it's just gross. He's saying, don't let bitterness take root in your life because it will affect the church in terrible ways. It'll spread. You have to cut that off at the root. Lastly, the third person we are to look out for and to make sure we ourselves are not guilty of being like is the, the person of Esau, who we studied in Genesis um, you know, last year with Jared. We, we learned about Esau, and I'm not going to go into the details, but the text does explain enough to make sense of it. He says this, See to it that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. Esau is a picture of the consumeristic person. I feel like Esau would be the person who's very comfortable living in the suburbs of Atlanta, Georgia. This is the kind of person who loves the instant gratification culture. This is the kind of person who is a picture of our society. One, one Bible teacher says that this, this case of Esau is, is a picture of our world, and I think that's exactly right. What tempts you to forfeit or to devalue the godliness in your life? Is it the social pressure? Is it the physical comforts of a single meal, something as flippant as that, like Esau? What are the things, the pleasures, the, the consumeristic items that maybe are drowning out your desires for holiness that you need to get rid of? Endurance takes a Jesus-focused faith, and enduring God's discipline is a sign that he loves you. And endurance can only successfully happen in community. We have to remember that. It takes the church to make it to the end. I need you guys. You need each other. We need each other. It's a community project. So the gospel gives us guts to keep going. The gospel gives us grace to not give up. If you don't know what this gospel is, if you don't know what this grace is, if you've never experienced the fatherly love from God in Jesus Christ, that's why we're here this morning. We want to celebrate Jesus who signed our adoption papers with his blood, and he guarantees for any of you who do not know God as Father, who do not know Jesus as your older brother, who accomplished the righteous life that you couldn't, that you are welcomed into the family by faith, by turning from your old life and trusting in him with your eternity. I encourage you to consider that. Consider Jesus. He is worth it. He's worth it. So let's praise him together in prayer, and then we will sing. Heavenly Father, it is so easy to be entangled by the sins that we've clung to. It is so easy to give up a race. It is so easy to fall in this life. We need you. We need your grace. We need you to show up in mighty ways and help us to not forget that you have showed up in a mighty way, in the most important way in Jesus Christ who went to the cross for us. We praise you. We celebrate Christ and what he's done in our lives. Help us to live in light of this gospel that cleanses us of sins, that gives us the courage to keep going, to keep confessing, to keep confiding in a good God who loves us and disciplines us. And for those who don't know you yet today, Lord, I pray that you would wake their hearts up, wake their minds up to you, help them to trust in you for the first time. We ask this in Christ's name, amen. I just wanna say one more thing. As we enter into worship, I heard a fantastic line recently, and I just I wanna share this with you because it's, it's affected the way that I've been singing. And I love singing, and I hope you love singing. Somebody said that sinners make great singers. So I want you to think about that. Why, does, why, why is it that sin in our lives, being cleansed from the Lord, make us great singers? That's something to sing about. It's good news. So sinners make the best singers, and I want to hear all of you sing joyfully and gladly today 
because in Christ we have a guaranteed forgiveness, a pardon, and a righteous life that should cause us to be the greatest singers that Swanee Georgia has heard this morning. So let's do that. If you guys would go ahead and stand up. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss. The father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one. Bring many sons to glory. Behold the Lamb upon the cross, my sin upon his shoulders, ashamed I hear. torn and beaten left without reason to move on then you reached down
we don't feel or we don't, we don't see typically the need to rid ourselves of sin the way that God sees, um, the way that we need to rid ourselves of sin. So when suffering comes, you need to ask the question, who's your daddy? I loved it. That was great. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. And the church said, amen. You guys are dismissed.